All right, everybody. We, uh, we're going to try this mic now this time and see how things go. Everybody hear me OK in the back? All right. So it's warm now. So now you have to stay awake on me. Don't fall asleep. I'll walk out and point at you. So I, uh, you know, I, I mentioned earlier about the accent. I have had to learn new words since coming here. Words I've heard before, but um, I have to just learn. You know, you all say boot of a car. We say the trunk of a car. Uh, boot is what we wear on our feet back in the United States. You all say flat. We say apartment. A flat back home is what women wear without heels. They wear flats. And now, after Pastor Aaron spoke, I've had to learn a new word. It's not sweet, it's not bitter, it is sweater. So where is Pastor Aaron? Oh, wherever he is. Well, I've had to learn a new one, sweater now. So I like that. It's not sweet, it's not bitter, it's sweater. All right, we're going to be Luke chapter 17. If you'll take your Bibles and go to Luke chapter 17, I've entitled this uh, this teaching, Life Before Christ Returns. How many of you are looking forward to the second coming of Christ? Amen. If he were to come even before I finish, I would be just delighted. He'll do a much better word with the teaching than I will. And so we're all looking forward to the imminent return of Jesus. And so we're going to talk a little bit about what life is going to be like, as Jesus told us, just prior to his second coming, because we're living in these days. So I'm going to be reading here from Luke chapter 17. I'm going to read verses 20 through 37. So Luke chapter 17, starting at verse 20. Now when he, that is Jesus, was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with your observation." Nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Then he said to the disciples, the days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there, do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed." In that day, he who is on the housetop and his goods are in the house, let him not come down to take them away. And likewise, the one who was in the field, let him not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, in that night, there will be two men in one bed. The one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field, the one will be taken and the other left. And they answered and said to him, Where, Lord? And so he said to them, Wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Let's pause there and pray. Lord, it is good to be here. I thank you for these folks who have gathered here for this day. They could be doing a hundred other things, but they've chosen to be here. And I thank you for them. And I pray your blessing on our time together as we look at this passage that you taught us, Lord, about life just prior to your second coming. Prepare our hearts, strengthen our souls, that we would live for your glory in these last days. 
and we give you the praise and the honor and the thanks. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, of course, the context here in Luke 17, the context of this passage is in reference to the second coming of Christ and what the culture will be like leading up to that great event. Now, we're going to study this passage in what I call rewind, as I'm going to start at the end and work our way backwards. I think it'll make sense as I, as I teach it this way with you. But I want you to first look at how this passage ended there, the last sentence of verse 37, because it's a little peculiar where we ended there, the last verse of verse 37, last sentence of verse 37. Jesus says, wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together. Now, some of your translations, instead of eagles, might say vultures, and the idea is a bird of prey that feeds on dead animals. So both eagles and vultures are scavenge animals. They, they are birds of prey. They feed on dead carcasses of dead animals. And when Jesus says this, wherever the body is, there the eagles will be gathered together, it is believed that that was actually a common expression in that day. Now, I'm not familiar with all the expressions here in the UK, but in America, there's this common expression, where there's smoke, there's fire. Is that here too? Okay. So where there's smoke, there's fire. It's a very common saying. That's probably what this saying was like in Jesus' day when he says, wherever the body is, there the eagles would be gathered together. And he's using that, that statement in the context of his second coming to basically say this, just as certain as eagles and vultures will prey on dead animals and you will see that kind of thing, you can be certain that Jesus Christ is coming again. And everybody will see it. It'll be known. It will not be a mystery. And then he goes on here in this passage to describe what life will be like on earth just prior to his second coming. And so now as we work our way backwards, so that's the last verse where Jesus says kind of this bizarre thing. Well, it was probably a very common saying in his day, where there's smoke, there's fire. He's saying, just as eagles and vultures prey on dead animals, you can be certain I'm coming again. But then in the body of this text, he's going to talk about both spiritual and social indicators, what life will be like on earth just prior to his second coming. And so if, if you want to advance to the first slide, one of the first things he speaks about here is spiritual. And number one, he says that there will be the rise of false teachers and false messiahs. Look again here. Uh, in your chapter, Luke 17, verses 22 to 24. Let me just highlight verses 22 to 24 again, where he says, Then he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Look here, look there, do not go after them or follow them. For as the lightning that flashes out of one part under heaven shines to the other part under heaven, so also the Son of Man will be in his day." So what he's saying here basically is that people will long for his appearing, and in their longing for his appearing, unfortunately, there will be many who will go after false teachers, false messiahs, false prophets, because they so desperately want to see his second coming. And Jesus says, don't go after them. Do not go after them. People will long to see my day. But he says they're going to fall victim to these false teachers, false prophets, and false messiahs. So do not follow them. Do not go after them. And, and he says, listen, here's how you know you won't miss my second coming. That's when he speaks there about like lightning from one part of the heaven to the other part of heaven. It'll be very visible. You will know my second coming. You won't have to be afraid. Did I miss his second coming? It's not like somebody's going to come up to you and say, hey, did you happen to see Jesus at McDonald's in New York City? <laughs> oh, he was rocking the tunic and the sandal thing. It was awesome. And you'll be like, no, I didn't know. He showed up at McDonald's in New York. I didn't know that. And nobody's going to have to have that conversation. Because when Jesus comes again, everybody will know. Like lightning from one side of the sky to the other, it's very, very visible. This is what Jesus tells us in Revelation 1-7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him. Every eye will see him. But in the meantime, he warns us about imposters, false teachers, 
False prophets, people who will claim to know the truth, but they're not teaching the truth. People who claim to be the Messiah, but they're not really the Messiah. He says, don't fall for them. It will not, my second coming will not be a mystery. You will know it. So don't run around looking for the Messiah. It'll be clear when I do come. If you go running around looking for Messiah, you're going to find a, quote, Messiah, small m, and you're going to be falling for some heresy. So he says, be warned about this kind of thing. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 15 to 16, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruit. And Peter said something similar, 2 Peter 2, 1 to 3. He says this, But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways. Listen to that. Many will follow their shameful ways. This is 2 Peter 2, 1 to 3. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with stories they have made up. Their condemnation has long been hanging over them and their destruction has not been sleeping. And so... Peter warns us there in 2 Peter. Jesus warns us in Matthew and here in Luke. There are going to be false teachers. Closer to the return of Christ, there will be the rise of false teachers and false prophets. Basically, any pastor, teacher, evangelist, Christian author who does not believe in the inspiration and inerrancy of the Word of God or who teaches or preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus of the Bible is a false teacher. And they will try to exploit you. They will do things out of greed to just try to line their pockets. They will use the gospel. They will twist it. They will tickle your ears. They will tell you whatever you want to hear in order to get what they want from you. And Jesus warns us. And listen, friends, they are out there now. False teachers are out there now. Do not believe somebody just because they're on television. Do not believe them because they have a big church. Do not believe them because they write a lot of books. You shouldn't believe me. You shouldn't believe your pastor. You should search the scriptures daily to make sure what you're hearing is true. That's why Paul says, that's why Paul says in Acts 17, 11, he commends the Bereans over the Thessalonians. He said, the Bereans were of more noble character because they received the message, but they searched the scriptures daily to make sure that what Paul said was true. You have to know your Bibles. You have to know your Bibles enough to be able to recognize truth from heresy because we're living in a time where there are some really slick people who are telling you all kinds of things that your itching ears want to hear, but are in fact, some of them, false teachers and false prophets. I'm not trying to disparage everybody on TV. I'm not trying to disparage every pastor, every author. But I am simply saying we better be wise in the time because as we get closer to the return of Christ, Jesus warns us about false teachers, false prophets, false messiahs. So we have to know the word in order to distinguish what is true from what is false. And then Jesus speaks here in this text about some of the social indicators just prior to his return. And this is where he compares the time just prior to his return to the days of Noah and Lot. The days of Noah and Lot. Now, both of those men are mentioned in the book of Genesis. Their lives were separated by about 250 years. They were the righteous minority living among the wicked majority of their day. In fact, things were so bad during the days of Noah. I'll just read to you. I know this is familiar to, to many of you, all of you perhaps, but Genesis 6, 5 to 8 describes the days of Noah. It says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that's why God rescued Noah. Because Noah was a righteous man who wanted to honor the Lord. So he experienced the grace of God. 
Now, years ago, I had a man come into my office. He was actually on the a government of our local town. Uh, he was an official in our town government because our church was trying to expand and we had to get permission of the town government to sign off on, on our, our rebuilding plans. And uh, he was not a believer and he, and he knocked on my office door one day and just came in unannounced. And uh, he, he said to me, he said, I have a problem with uh, God and the Bible. And I said, what's your problem? He goes, it's the story of Noah. He goes, it really bothers me. He said, why would a loving God condemn the whole world to death by a worldwide flood except for Noah and his family? He says, that doesn't sound like a very loving God. I said, his name was David. I said, David, you're getting the perspective backwards. God sent an ark to rescue anyone who wanted to get on. But everybody mocked God and mocked Noah and except for Noah's family decided they didn't want to get on the ark. And yet you're blaming God that they all perished. God had a rescue plan. Don't blame God that the people of the earth died. God sent an ark to rescue people, and they mocked God to their own demise. So when he heard it from that perspective, he's like, okay, okay. See, God is always attempting to rescue us. He wants none to perish but all to come to repentance. That's the love of God for the world. He loved us so much, he sent his son Jesus to rescue us. That's a father who loves the world so much he'd spill the blood of his son to save us, but yet still people are mad at God. I can't believe God would condemn us. How could God allow this? Hey, it's a sinful world. And God, knowing it, put a plan in motion to rescue us and redeem us. He did it with Noah and his family. He did it for the world with Jesus on a cross. But Jesus said, listen, get ready, because like it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. And then he mentions also Lot here. He compares the times with Lot. It's, it, God was grieved that, about all the wickedness and the sexual perversion of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's where we get our English word sodomy from the name of that town. And so, but again, God sent two angels in human form to rescue anyone who wanted to come out. The only people who wanted to come out was Lot and his family. And they had to be, you know, physically, like God so desperately wanted to rescue Lot and his family. Like those angels in human form had to physically snatch them and say, you got to get out of town because God's judgment is about to rain down here. Genesis 19, 16, it says, when Lot lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hand, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him. And they brought him out and set him outside the city. And then a further down in Genesis 19, 24 and 25, it says, And then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities. All this to say, when you consider this comparison with not and, uh, uh, Noah and Lot, there I just combined some words, like the pastor Aaron is just <laughs> not. Okay, it's Noah and Lot. Switter. Switter. Okay. When you look at Noah and Lot, there's something I have in common, which is only Noah and his family, eight in all, Lot and his family ended up being only three. He went out with his wife and two daughters, should have been four, but remember his wife turned back. And it wasn't just that she glanced. The idea in the language is she looked longingly at what she was leaving, and then God turned her into a pillar of salt, just like froze her right there. It's interesting, when you go down to the Dead Sea, there is this... This, no, I'm not kidding. There actually is. Our tour guide pointed it out. He's like, you see, you see, there's this remnant of it could be like a human being, like kind of frozen in time, <laughs> you know. And of course, after that event, it was a it was a very difficult night around Lot's dinner table. And at any time, he turned to his daughters and say, "Pass the salt, please." Ah, ah. <laughs> your mom. Oh, I forgot about your mom. Oh. But the point is, point number two, if you're taking notes, point number two, the next slide, the righteous will be the minority living among the wicked majority. If you are feeling outnumbered, you are not imagining it. Because Christians will more and more become the minority in the culture as we get closer to the return of Christ. That's part of this comparison here. There's a lot of things you could say about the culture of Noah's day, the culture of Lot's day, but one thing I think is overlooked is that there was just eight in all and three in all. They were quite the minority among a wicked majority. And that, that actually is not to be discouraging. That is 
actually to be encouraging to, in this sense that, okay, I'm not losing my mind when I feel like I'm, I'm few. And, and if you feel like you're a part of the few, like the remnant, the minority, um, that's because you are. And as we get closer to the return of Christ, you're going to feel more and more like you're part of a minority. That just a smaller and smaller group of those who are really devoted followers of Jesus Christ. It's sad, but it is true. And it is what Jesus predicted. So we should be prepared for that. Now, in addition, um, I think this is also a fair comparison about the days of Noah and Lot. Number three, if you're taking notes wickedness in the world will not only be tolerated but also celebrated as normal and routine are we living in that day yes like people in the days of noah and lot people living in the days leading up to the return of christ will be living out their lives like nothing's really wrong that's why jesus says here look again in your bibles verses 26 to 28 Jesus says in verse 26, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. You see how it was just all routine. Life was carrying on like normal they were just living out things like everything was fine. Not Noah and Lot, though. They realized this is not fine. This is not normal. And so God rescued them. In fact, Peter tells us, you don't need to turn there. Just listen to 2 Peter 2, 7 to 8. Peter writes, Lot was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. He writes, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. That's what Peter writes. Peter says Lot was so tormented in his spirit because of the climate and the culture and the condition of his society at his time. Listen, anybody feel a little tormented? You look around at your culture, you look around at the world, and it just it torments us, it grieves us, it burdens us. And that's the way Lot felt. Jesus says it's going to be very similar. If you've ever felt oppressed in your spirit by the things that are happening in our culture today, if you've ever felt tormented by the stuff of late that you see and hear, it's to be expected if you're trying to live a godly life in an evil world. Now, if you're not trying to live a godly life, you're not going to feel tormented because you're just going to be doing what they do. It's just going to be party. It's just not going to feel like any different. It's when you're trying to live a godly life that you'll feel tormented in your soul by all the ungodliness around us. But here's another important comparison. Just as God rescued Noah and his family and Lot and his family before he brought down judgment, he will do the same for believers before he brings judgment on the earth. It's point number four, if you're taking notes. Number four, God will rescue the righteous. Did he not rescue Noah and his family? Did he not rescue Lot and his family? God will rescue the righteous before he brings judgment on the earth. This is what Jesus meant here in verses 34 to 36. Now, the first part sounds a little weird about two men in a bed, one taking the other left. Like, what? Um, this is... It's, it's very platonic. It's just basically saying two guys were taking a nap. You know, often in those days during the workday, they'd, they'd take a little siesta, and a couple of men were laying down after, you know, in the middle of a hard day's work. Uh, it talks about how two women were grinding grain. It talks about how two men were in the field. And it talks about how one was taken, another left. One was taken, another left. Now, Jesus is explaining to us here. He's giving us a glimpse of the doctrine of the rapture that there will be one taken and one left. God is going to take the rap the, he's going to rapture the righteous from the earth before the day of judgment. Now, look, at, you know, I get into these debates with my friends who uh, do not believe in a pre-trib position of the rapture, which I hold to. I believe the Bible teaches a pre-tribulation uh, um, message of the rapture, which means that the church is going to be taken before the judgment comes upon the earth spoken of between Revelation 6 and 18, okay? And so 
I hold to that view, and, I, and part of the reason I can defend it is a passage like this. Jesus is, look, judgment came after he rescued the righteous, after he took Noah and his family, after he took Lot and his family. God's going to take care of his bride. Uh, he's not going to, you know, uh, my dear now gone to be with the Lord friend, Dr. Ed Heinsen, I remember him once saying in, in his voice, I just love Dr. Heinsen, but he said, do you really, you honestly think that, that God's going to allow his bride to be beaten up, like go through the tribulation, beat her up a little bit, and then take her to the wedding banquet? I don't think so. <laughs> like God's not going to just oh, beat, up, beat up my bride a little bit, and then I'll take her to the banquet. I don't think so. The Bible teaches a pre-tribulation position. It's what we hold to, that God is going to rescue the righteous before judgment. Now that's 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18, how he, he talks about um, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall be with the Lord forever. Well, Pastor Gary, the word rapture is nowhere in the Bible. Well, the doctrine is, though, and in fact, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, when it talks about how those who are alive and remain will be caught up, it's the Greek word harpazo, but in the Latin Vulgate, it's raptus, is where we get our English word rapture. The word trinity is not in the Bible either, but we believe the trinity. The word Bible is not in the Bible, but we believe the Bible. <laughs> there are certain words that are not in the Bible, but it teaches the doctrine of it or the position of it. And so Jesus teaches here, gives us a glimpse of this idea of the rapture. Two people here, one's taken, another left. Two people here, one's taken, another left. Also, Peter would write in 2 Peter 2, 5 to 9, listen to this. And God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. This is 2 Peter 2, verse 7. And delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust for punishment for the day of judgment. So Peter basically is echoing the same thing. He says, he talks about Noah, he talks about Lot, and he says both those guys were rescued, the ungodly condemned, and so it will be on the day of judgment. And so, basically in summary of these first four points here, Jesus is saying, just prior to his second coming, there will be the rise of false teachers and false messiahs, the righteous will be the minority living among the wicked majority, Wickedness in the world will not only be tolerated, but celebrated as normal and routine, and God will rescue the righteous. In the meantime, all right, now we work our way back to the very beginning of this passage in verses 20 to 21. And I want you to notice to whom he is speaking in verses 20 and 21, because the audience shifts in verse 22. Notice in verse 20, it says, now when he was asked by the Pharisees, circle that in your Bible, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Verse 22, then it shifts. Notice, then he said to his disciples, circle that. So he's, he's basically in a crowd somewhere where he's got two listeners, two groups of listeners. He's got the Pharisees who don't believe in him, and they're always challenging him, and he's got his disciples. So he turns to his disciples to talk about the things related to his second coming because they're going to get it. And they're going to have a greater understanding of what he's talking about because they have the spiritual mind to receive it and the spiritual ears to hear it and the spiritual heart to believe it. But he doesn't say all that part to the Pharisees. The first part, he says, to the Pharisees has to do here with the kingdom of God not coming with your careful observation. He said, people, people you know, he says, they're not going to say here it is or there it is. 
And he says this, it sounds kind of mystical, but I want to unpack it with you. He says, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Now, many times in your Bibles, the phrase kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven are interchangeable. It's interesting that only Matthew in his gospel uses the phrase kingdom of heaven. All the other, the, the other three, Mark, Luke, and John, only use the phrase kingdom of God. Matthew only uses kingdom of heaven. Mark, Luke, and John use the phrase kingdom of God. So we're reading here from Luke. So he's using this kingdom of God. But usually when you look back and forth between Matthew and the other three gospels, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God are pretty interchangeable. But there is a slight difference in this. When you are speaking of the kingdom of heaven, sometimes it can specifically refer to a place because it mentions heaven in that phrase. So sometimes when you think of the kingdom of heaven, it can, it can mean the kingdom of God in general terms, but it can be specific about a place, heaven, where God dwells. Now, God's omnipresent, I get that, but the heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool, God says. So his dwelling place can be anywhere at all times, but he, he draws attention to the fact that heaven is his throne, the earth is his footstool. It's, I think, in part what Jesus meant in the Lord's Prayer when he says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, he's literally asking us to look forward to the day that there will come a day when there will literally be heaven on earth, where where God's kingdom will be established on earth. He will rule and reign forever and ever. It will be a new heaven, new earth, a new day, okay? But when you think about the kingdom of God in general, whereas the kingdom of heaven might sometimes refer to the reign and rule of God in a place, the kingdom of God more particularly refers to the rule and reign of God in a person. In a person. So when he speaks here to the Pharisees, and he says, listen, The kingdom of God will not come with your careful observation. Neither will people say, here it is or there it is. For the kingdom of God is within you. What he's saying is, and this is one more slide if you want to advance it. Before you will ever enjoy the kingdom of God literally, you must first be submitted to his rule and reign spiritually. So what he's challenging them about, and I think it's good for us to be challenged about this as well. You can say all day long, Jesus is coming again. Yes, praise God and amen to that, right? We look forward to when the king is coming. But we better be sure that the king is ruling and reigning in our own hearts and lives now. If we just go around talking about the second coming, which I'm all for, love to preach on it, believe it, know what could happen at any moment, the imminent return of Jesus Christ... What does, God, what does Jesus start with? What does he lead with in this passage? Even though he's talking to the Pharisees. He leads with the idea of, I better be ruling and reigning as king in your life, in your heart, before you will ever understand, appreciate, or enjoy my second coming. That's the challenge. Is he king in my life now? Is he Lord of every aspect of my life now? I get it. I'm looking forward to the second coming of Christ. But the bigger issue I need to deal with day in and day out is, is he king of my heart today? Today. Not when is he coming tomorrow. Is he king today? God is going to sort out when he's coming. The timetable is going to unravel. And it's going to happen in God's perfect timing. What I need to be looking at about my own life is, is he king now? And Jesus has given us this instruction about what things will look like prior to the literal kingdom coming, but he leads with a spiritual kingdom, God's rule and reign within us, and that's what we should be most focused on, okay? It's his kingdom rule and reign in my heart, in my life. Is Jesus king of every aspect of my life? Because where he's not, I need to die daily. I need to take up my cross and die daily so that he's king of every aspect of my life. 
because that's what he wants first and foremost. The kingdom of God will not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, for the kingdom of God is within you. Is he king now? Okay? Before, he can, before we can really enjoy and experience, oh, the second coming, is he king now? One last slide, Jude, verses 20 to 21, says this. I, I'm giving it to you in the NIV because I like the way it reads. It says this, but you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your rule and your reign. You are sovereign. You are lifted up. You are seated on a throne. Heaven is your throne. Earth is your footstool. You are king of all. But we should also, Lord, be seeking you to be king of my life every day. Help us, Lord, to make this personal. Instead of just focusing so much on your second coming, yes, Lord, we want to be rescued. Yes, Lord, life is weary at times. We want you to come, Maranatha. But, Lord, how can we make you king now? How can we honor you as king now? Yes, make us wise about the signs of the times. We are living in the days of Noah and Lot all over again. The handwriting is literally on the wall because it's in your word. You're showing us what is to come. You're showing us and telling us things that will happen. So we're not surprised by these things. Wickedness is being not only tolerated but celebrated. We often feel like we're part of a minority now among a wicked majority. We get these things. So, Lord, prepare our hearts that we might acknowledge you and make you king now. Every aspect of our lives. I pray, Father, for someone who might be here today who does not know you in a personal way. You're not king of their life. They would be honest enough to admit it. They're king of their own lives. But I pray today would be the day that they get off the throne and invite you into the throne of their heart to be king and Lord over all. That they would trust you as Lord and Savior, that they would say, Jesus, come into my heart, save me today. Forgive me of my sins. I acknowledge you as king of my life. May your kingdom come. May your rule and reign be done in my life and then on earth as it is in heaven. And we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. God bless you all.